Okay. So get started. Yeah, so people are in. I didn't see any participants. Yeah, because it's a webinar. It's not. Okay. There are Great. Okay, good. I'll take it away then. So um, welcome. Welcome to today's uh, webinar. My name is Peter Linderoth. I'm the director of water quality uh, with Save the Sound, joined today by the North Fork Environmental Council. Um, we're looking forward to kind of going through some of the work we've been doing on the east, uh, east part of Long Island. And um, I wanted to point out, if you have questions, um, please put them in the chat and we'll save some time at the end of the presentation to uh, get to those questions. So again, my name's Peter. I'm the director of water quality at Save the Sound. I've been on the team for um, almost six years now. Uh, I work in a New York office. And as my title would imply, I, I work a lot on water quality. Um, Save the Sound, our mission is to protect and restore um, the waters and watershed of Long Island Sound. I specifically oversee our water quality monitoring initiatives. So on the water sampling. Um, I also work with our legal team to bring legal actions at times and uh, do some public testimony occasionally and submit public comments as well. I'm really happy to be here today. I'm gonna to be discussing the Unified Water Study, um, as you all probably saw from the talk description, um, but a quick discussion overview. I really, it's hard to talk about the Unified Water Study or, or what we say the UWS without bringing up the Long Island Sound Report Card. So I'm gonna to briefly touch up on that, then go into the meat of what the Unified Water Study is, uh, look a little bit at data to action, and then, as I mentioned, we'll do quick questions at the end. I'm actually joined by some other presenters. So we'll wait, I think, till the end of all the presentations and take some questions. So the Long Island Sound Report Card, I hope many of you are familiar with it. Um, it's a biennial. So every two year release that Save the Sound puts out and it's grading the environmental health of the waters of Long Island Sound. And I'm gonna get into that a little bit more shortly. We're looking at the three Long Island Sound report cards that Save the Sound has worked on. We actually um, took it as a very friendly handoff from the University of Maryland. They do report cards internationally, Chesapeake Bay, of course, but also internationally. And they had issued, I believe it was two prior report cards to us getting the handoff. Uh, actually, maybe it was one, excuse me, one and then some specific ones in uh, harbors. Uh, but it was a very friendly handoff. They kind of trained us and gave us some guidance on how to do these things. And in 2016, um, Save the Sound became the um, home of the Long Island Sound Report Card. And it makes a lot of sense, I mean, seeing that we work on the sound. Um, so 2016, here's 2018 in the middle. You can see we have a thing for lighthouses on the cover. And then 2020 was our most recent release. Um, we updated the cover a little and our, our uh, digital kind of project people did a fantastic job on that. I'm not gonna go into this, but it is a fourfold. I'm not gonna go into each page that is um, if you're interested, you can really just drop Long Island Sound Report Card into a Google search and find this. Um, we have ways that people can take actions to protect water, um, a little bit of an executive summary here, a discussion on the Unified Water Study. Um, that's me working with one of our Bronx River Alliance groups, kind of doing an on the water training. Um, and the meat of it, the inside of it, I guess I should say, is a poster, um, really, and poster format. And you can see we've graded. Long Island Sound, and it's a, a to F grading using water quality parameters. So using empirical data, real data collected by um, agencies, but also unified water study groups. Um, that's a monitoring program as well. The big chunks of grades in the middle are what we call the main stem or the open water grades for Long Island Sound. So you have the Eastern Basin all the way to the East. And then all the way to the West is the Western Narrows, which is mostly um, New York City waters. Um, and you can see there's a gradient. Uh, we could talk about that in the q and I'm not here to talk in depth about the report card, but you can see an expected gradient in water quality in the open waters from east to west. And then new to 2020, fueled by unified water study uh, monitoring data are the circles that you see around the margins of Long Island Sound. And those are in our bays, harbors, and inlets. We call them the bay grades. And off to the my right, um, but the left of the report card, you can see those bay grades. and each parameter that's monitored by a unified water study group receives a grade, annual grade. And then um, each bay also receives one overall grade on how it's doing in terms of environmental health. Um, so we could talk a little bit about the parameters if people wanna ask, but when I talk environmental health, I'm not talking about how safe is the water safe for swimming. We use different water quality indicators for that. In this perspective, we're really looking at 
you know, how healthy is the water for aquatic life? You know, fish, shellfish, um, crabs, lobsters, you know, all the really great animals that we have in Long Island Sounds. How healthy is the water for those animals? Now, a quick thank you to the data providers. So like I said, the open water data is provided by state agencies and federal agencies. The embayments or the bay grades are provided by unified water study groups. And now I'm gonna talk about what that is. So the unified water study fills the gaps um, in respect to filling the margins of Long Island Sound with really important comparable data. There's lots of data that exist in, in over 30 plus, and in some cases over hundred years in New York City waters of water quality data that exists for the open waters kind of away from the harbors and bays. Um, but there wasn't a lot and there up until we did the UWS, there wasn't a lot of comparable or similarly collected water quality data for the bays and harbors. And when I say bays and harbors, you might hear me say embayments or harbors or inlets. Um, here's what we're looking at. The light blue um, outlines in this map are the, I'm gonna call them embayments now, um, around Long Island Sound. There's over a hundred of them actually. And you know, Mattituck Creek, for example, being one, so the unified water study was designed specifically to collect for groups to be able to collect data in those bays and harbors. Um, and it needed to be achievable. Um, when we were developing the UWS, um, all kinds of groups came together. We, it was well over, it probably took us about two years to actually develop it. Um, we had state groups, EPA groups, nonprofits, you know, volunteers, all of us got together, talked about how we we're gonna do this monitoring and um, when all of that collective intellectual dust settled, we decided that all the groups that are participating in this monitoring program would do tier one monitoring. We split it into two tiers. Tier one is all groups in the study do this. These parameters, DO or dissolved oxygen down to temperature and salinity, generate those grades that are in the report card. And all the groups in the study do those parameters. Tier two is sort of like icing on the cake. It's a little bit more um, for management applications. So we submit these to the states for their Clean Water Act assessments, tier one data two, um, but only a subset of the groups do tier two monitoring. The monitoring season runs from May to October, it's six months, and it's conducted in uh, compliance with an EPA, Environmental Protection Agency approved quality assurance project plan. And that's a, that's a fairly large technical document that outlines all the details of the monitoring program. And by complying to it and having all the groups comply to it, um, we administer it, but everyone needs to comply to the procedures and other um, elements that are in this plan. We have a really great comparable data set where people collecting data on the Western side of Long Island Sound, say down in like Flushing Bay, are collecting data the same way as people in Mattituck Creek or the people up in Niantic River, which is in Eastern Connecticut and everything in between, everyone's collecting data the same way so when it comes in, it's very comparable. We can compare it. And here we're looking at where we are now with the unified water study. It took us a while to get to all these bays that are covered, but everything in blue has a monitoring program as part of the UWS um, with data is out there. I put the thumbs up at Flushing Bay. That's a new group, but also because we have a social media presence. So if you're using social media, please go ahead and go to Twitter or go to Facebook and do hashtag UWS or hashtag unified water study. And you'll see things pop up and go ahead and give us some likes or, or comments or anything um, at social media nature. So it took us a while to get here. I was going to go over the timeline of how we got here. So this is now, and we're, we're continuing to grow, but this is up to 2021. Really good coverage. Um, we're feeling really good about it. But um, in 2015, this is the timeline. We took, like I said, the report card and started to coordinate the unified water study um, we piloted the study in 2016 with some very brave groups that put some trust in us to pilot our procedures and the time we were going to go out and do the data collection. 2017 officially marked the start of the unified water study with 11 groups and 21 bays. And then we were piloting the tier two work. And one of our really close partner groups launched the equipment loan program, which is really, really important um, for the study. I'll get to that later. And if you, as you follow this timeline, as you follow it down, um, 2018, you can see we had a lot of growth. We added nine new groups, um, 15 new embayments. 2019, we added a couple new groups um, and they helped out with some additional um, tier two embayments. And then 2020, 2021, um, North Fork Environmental Council joined us in 2021. Um, we did some rotations as well. And you can see we're now in 42 
Long Island Sound and Baymans, which is a big, you know, that's almost half of all the bays and harbors in Long Island Sound. And we continue to grow. 2022, I just haven't made it yet, but I will be, is going to include at least two new groups. And we're on par to bring another couple of groups in in 2023 as well. So we are growing this study. And it's great. It's a really fun uh, collective to work with. I really enjoy it. My team really enjoys working with everyone in the program. A couple of things I want to just run through. This one's maybe a little technical, but all the groups that come into the study, we go through a station selection process, no matter how large their bay is. So uh, if anyone knows uh, the Connecticut coastline, this is Darien Harbor. It's a smaller embayment, so it has four stations. That's the minimum that we can have for the study. We use a similar size grid, the same grid. It's a 0.42 kilometer square grid to generate these stations randomly. And then we need to kind of move them around sometimes for depth and safety reasons. But we do the same process here as we would in say Flushing Bay or as we did in Mattituck Creek. Same process and we do have representative station selection. We avoid bias in that. We also do annual field and procedures trainings. Really, really important um, to keep everyone on the same page. There's people in this study that have been doing this frankly longer than I have. Um, and they still appreciate the training program because it brings us all together and make it really is just a hands-on training. As you can see from this picture, this is Kevin. Uh, for, he does monitoring in Black Rock Harbor, also in Connecticut, um, kind of showing off one of the sons or the units we put in the water to collect measurements. But we all get together and do this. And, and that was pre-COVID, of course. So we haven't been able to get together for the last couple of years. We moved it to an online module system, but it's been working pretty well. And we'll continue to keep that in place but hopefully in the future, we can all get together and we hold about six of these. We don't have all 20 plus groups come to one training. Um, we break it into smaller groups so people can really interact with each other and uh, we can give like the hands-on support and training that we wanna do every year. We do field audits. Um, that means we used to go visit everybody, every group around the sound within the first two months just to make sure things were going well. We also do technical support all season. So people can call me. Elena Colon is our environmental analyst. Jenna Morrissey, our technician. Um, Gavin, our assistant soundkeeper, whoever it is, they could call in and get technical support um, all season. And then we also, um, these two things really help, these three things help with mandatory QAPP or quality assurance project plan compliance and good rake toss form. <laughs> we actually do rake tosses as part of our seaweed assessments in tier one. And if the training goes all the way down into how do you toss a rake, how far should it go out, um, and things like that. There's an equipment loan program for the Unified Water Study. So all the equipment um, is loaned out at the beginning of the season that a group needs to complete the monitoring season. And then it all comes back to us. Um, it just got back to us actually um, in mid, late November. And we start cleaning it and putting it into winter storage, taking care of it for long-term maintenance. And then we reissue it again um, come April. So it lowers study expenses to do it this way. When you buy 20 plus units of something at a time, it greatly reduces the cost. It really eases group entry so everyone doesn't have to go out and go over this you know, very lengthy kind of purchasing sheet for all the equipment that you need for just one group. And it really helps with data comparability. So everyone's using the same instruments, the same standards to calibrate those instruments, the same GPS units. Um, it really helps with comparability um, in the data collection. And on that vein also, uh, we have one laboratory that does the um, water work that involves actually collecting samples and sending it to a laboratory. That's IEC, Interstate Environmental um, Commission. And here they're doing our chlorophyll um, analysis for us. It strengthens data comparisons. It's also a state certified laboratory. And a couple more, and then I'm actually gonna wrap up. Um, we also have a project template. So if we just gave everything to the, uh, our groups, but then said, you know, go ahead and submit your data back to us, it would be total chaos at the end of the season, right? So we have set data sheets, set field data sheets, set templates for data um, submission back to save the sound. And it helps with consistent formatting when the data comes back. It helps us with quality assurance checks. Um, the template holds tons of extra data that we can go and check um, in, you know, future years or that current year if we need to check. And it also really facilitates widespread sharing. So we enter all these data into a federal database. We have to because it's federally funded. Um, so when those data come to us really tidy, we can quickly get them in. And we do over 100,000 rows of data, it turns out, um, that's gone into the EPA water quality portal. You can also retrieve those data through our website, um, which is down there. 
it, it's the tidy data, like I said. So our columns are variables, our rows are observations. And when it comes back to us, it just makes everything work really nicely. We do quality assurance. Here's Mattituck Creek, for example, in 2020. We look at all the readings for a season when it comes back. And we do this for every parameter, for every depth. And we make sure there aren't any outliers or questionable readings that need further inspection by our team. And if there are, we get in touch with the monitoring group and bring them up and, and ask them about them. So it helps with quality assurance. And the last few I have here, data to action. So these data provide a roadmap to prioritize um, actions for restoration and protection of Long Island Sound waters. Um, they inform and engage the public. The A through F format's really good for your lay people out there that really just wanna take a quick look at a snap snapshot of the water quality. Supports EPA nitrogen strategy, New York State's um, Long Island Nitrogen Action Plan, Connecticut's integrated water quality reporting. Those are Clean Water Act requirements. These data are submitted to both states and the federal government for those. And it's acknowledged by elected officials um, when they advocate for additional funds for Long Island Sound. You can see these data on the Sound Health Explorer. I'd really encourage you to check out the Sound Health Explorer. Um, you could go, for example, to Mattituck Creek. This says group for the East End. But when we upload the next data set, uh, North Fork for the Envi North Fork Environmental Council will be 2020 and 2021. And you can see the grade, really dive in and get a lot of great little details on Sound Health Explorer. We also look and um, do this with the groups kind of systematically, but go through the nitrogen loading and that helps us determine the pollutants that are coming into the bays and harbors. In this case, Mattituck Creek, this is based on a science advisor's nitrogen loading work, which means how much nitrogen is entering a water um, way. A lot of nitrogen, as many of you know, causes problems. Excess algae um, growth, it can cause um, lower dissolved oxygen levels, which are really bad for aquatic life. Um, so you don't want too much nitrogen entering your system. So when we see a poor grade, we can pull up these um, charts and this, this loading information and see like, so in this case, uh, Mattituck Creek has 33% um, of its nitrogen coming from septic systems or on-site treatment systems, and then 54% from fertilizer. So those would be two big places to make cuts to help reduce nitrogen and maybe get a better grade. Although Mattituck tends to do pretty well. As you can see, a B minus in 2019, but it got an A in 2018. And the data that's been submitted so far actually looks pretty good for uh, 2020 and 2021. So with that, I think I'll turn it over to Stephen. We're gonna save questions and comments, I believe, till the end. I saw one in the chat. Um, we can get to that after. Stephen, take it away. Well, actually, I'm sorry, it's it's Debbie here. And um, uh, actually, Dawn and Dan are going to describe their hands-on day-to-day uh, testing of both Mattitude. Oh, yeah, good. yeah, we figured we'd we would let Dawn and Dan jump in here now and, and actually give people an idea of what it was like uh, being out on the water and testing once a week um, out in, uh, out in uh, Goldsmiths Inlet and um, Manitoba Creek. So Dawn and Dan, go ahead, take it away. You're muted there, Dawn. <laughs> Sorry, when we were starting the meeting, I rebooted and all my slides were, uh, they weren't up, so. Okay, so my name is Dawn Carroll. I actually work for the North Fork Environmental Council in their office, and this is my brother. Hello. This is my brother, Dan. Um, we took on <laughs> the testing for the two embayments that are on the east, you know, on the North Fork. Um, when we started this in April, we had no experience in this whatsoever. So there was a huge learning curve for us. Um, <laughs> so can you see, can you see this slide now? Yes, okay. All right, so um, this was a picture of Mattituck Creek or Mattituck Inlet, I guess we call it both. Um, I took this just recently, but you can see um, this is Mattituck Creek. So you can see by this map, there's six different points that we need to test. Um, so there's two embayments, you have to test each twice a month. 
So we kind of developed a schedule where we would go out every week. We aimed to go out on Thursdays um, just because that gave us the weekend just in case there was bad weather, which this year there was really only a couple of times that we didn't go out on that day. Um, so when we started at Mattituck, we realized very quickly that it was too big to go by, to use a kayak. Um, we weren't gonna get there. Another rule is that you have to do all the testing. Every, all the samples have to be taken within three hours of sunrise. So you're definitely under the gun <laughs> sometimes if you don't get out there very early, especially in June. Um, when the sun was coming up at 5 a.m. So we very quickly realized that um, we needed a boat and Anthony who owns Old Mill Inn allowed us to keep the boat there for the summer. So we could have a little, a little boat dock there with a little engine and get all the testing done within the three hours. Um, if you look at Goldsmith's Inlet, which is called Goldsmith or Goldsmith's Inlet, depending on who you ask, um, you can see it's much smaller. Um, we only have four points. And to put a boat in here would actually be just overkill. So this one, we actually developed a system where we would park, there's a little Suffolk County park right here. And then we got a kayak dolly and drag the kayak in to do these four points here. Um, all of this was by trial and error. <laughs> Right, Dan. Yes. <laughs> Here's us. This is Dan and I in the kayak on Goldsmith Inlet, um, collecting the data. Um, so just to go over what we do weekly, um, first, everything has to be calibrated. So there's a pre-calibration. So that has to be done. If we're going out the next morning, we would try to do it the day before. And since I'm not a scientist, my brother's, not a, my brother's not a scientist, um, you know, it was definitely a um, large learning curve because you had to calibrate this equipment and go through all of the different things that we're testing for by making sure that, you know, the equipment was going to work correctly. Then the next morning we would do the water sampling out in the water. And then when you come back, you have to do post calibration which needs to be done, I think within 24 hours. We just tried to do it usually the day that we came back. Oh, this is um, this is Mattisar Creek too, for sure. Um, so this is, a, this is really the data sheet that you use every time you go out. Um, and this has to be filled out. Every station has its own column. And these are all the things that we test for. So temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen percent, dissolved oxygen, chlorophyll, and turbidity. Also, when you're going out, you um, collect chlorophyll samples that you do separately as well. Um, so, you know, it was definitely, um, an interesting summer, but we have to say like some of the mornings we were out there, it was just so beautiful. Um, and we thought, you know, we wouldn't be out here if we weren't collecting the water samples. And like Mattituck Creek, the number of osprey nests were, it was like incredible. Like there was probably like 20. Yeah. Um, and you can see like, you know, this is like on a, a little old dock and um, this was both the parents there. So, um, and this is actually my brother. This is, this is also a Mattata Creek and that's him using the sound. And that's Mattata Creek and that's it. So we can ask questions at the end. Dawn and Dan, you did a fabulous job. You really uh, rose the occasion. I know there was a lot of um, training that was involved and um, a lot of reading, a lot of practicing, and um, you guys were amazing. So thank you so much for um, participating in this. And I know that there was lots of good data collected. 
Um, Peter, I'm sorry that um, I uh, was letting people in. We had um, a lot of people at the last minute who were asking for the Zoom link. So I'm sorry I um, was busy doing that in the very beginning of the presentation. But I want to thank you so much for uh, uh, all the good information that you've shared so far. And, and then um, I'd like to introduce Stephen Bascola, who um, joined in um, with us um, uh, as a member of the um, Save Metatuck Inlet group. Um, Stephen offered to um, create a, a web page to share um, data and to share information and to do some um, community outreach, which is an essential part of um, uh, this project. And uh, Stephen, why don't you take us through um, what you were involved with and um, uh, um, you know how you participated in the project as well. Sure, thank you. So um, I just wanna make sure you can see this presentation up. Okay, so um, we're Save Mattatuck Inlet. We're um, a group that has just actually hit our one year anniversary. Um, and so our group initially came together about a year ago um, over shared concerns um, about a proposed marine expansion along Mattatuck Creek. And one of our main concerns is water quality, both from a runoff perspective and from increased boat traffic um, along this waterway. And as our group grew and gained more experience, um, especially through guidance that we've received from Save the Sound, um, we realized our mission is, is even bigger and that we wanted to focus on um, you know, all aspects of, of, you know, quality of life along the inlet. Um, so Louise Harrison from Save the Sound gave us an educate, gave our group an education on uh, the unified water study. She raised the idea that, uh, you know, we could get involved by sharing some of the information on our social media platforms. So Facebook, Instagram, um, and our website. So we love the idea. Um, and, you know, our first step was to help uh, North Fork Environmental Council find their dock space. And so Anthony from the Old Mill is actually our neighbor. Um, and he was he was thrilled that we were um, uh, doing this, that, that the water quality study was being done. And he was happy to host the boat there. Um, and so together we, we created this page with um, North Fork Environmental Council and Save the Sound. So this was the stoplight page. And... Um, it's a quick reference guide specifically for the dissolved oxygen for the preliminary samples that were being collected along the six sites. And so once Dawn uh, would upload the, the data to save the sounds um, SharePoint, I would go on and retrieve it. And, and our goal here was to, to share this data in sort of a real time um, fashion. And so um, it was actually an easy update for me because luckily the, the samples all stayed above um, five milligrams per liter when it came to dissolved oxygen. So these, um, these green dots stayed green for the entire um, time we were sharing this data. And so um, then what we did is each time we'd update this um, the stoplight page, shared to our website, to, uh, to Facebook and Instagram. Uh, and the postings received pretty positive responses. People were interested for sure. Um, and I think the public liked the fact that there was actually water quality monitoring going on around the creek. Um, and so, you know, we were happy to participate um, and, and, you know, get that out there to the public. Um, and, you know, we're happy to post the results, you know, whenever, when the study's finalized and we're always uh, happy to participate um, in the future um, unified water studies that's, that are going to take place because we, um, we really want to see that the, you know, the Mattathic Inlet is, um, is cared for and is, uh, is watched out for, for sure. So, you know, thank you for, for having us uh, be part of this. So as you can see, there was great collaboration here, um, an organization that's been involved in this project for 20 years, is it, Peter? I'm sorry. No, that's OK. It's, uh, it's closer to five. Oops, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so five so years, five year but, but yeah, funded on. funded by the EPA, and um, so coming down from the federal level to the state level to the local community level, uh, with an environmental group involved, and then a community group that's uh, very dedicated to um, protecting our uh, local environment. So um, yeah, it was wonderful to to be able to have everyone working together. And um, do we have some questions? We'd be happy to uh, take some questions if you'd like to um, uh, 
just uh, add them to the Q and A section. I see there's one. Um, oh well, yeah, we got we got some of the questions answered on Q and A. I think Louise has her hand up. She might be wanting to say something too. Okay. I can't. All right. She is. Oh, please, can you unmute? <laughs> she, she unmuted and then remuted. Okay. Oh. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I put it in the chat. I'm just wondering if the uh, stoplight program is going to be expanded to other water bodies. Oh, you did put it in the chat. Yeah, thanks, Louise. Um, I didn't see that. We. Definitely, we'd love, we're gonna expand it. This was a, a first year kind of go and, and Steven and everyone on that end did such a great job with it. It, it really was a, a demonstration of how well it can work. Um, we're gonna write it up as more of a kind of a procedural thing and then offer it to, to groups to do across the sound. Um, I think it really, you know, I didn't touch up on it, but the report card grades that are generated from this data take some time to calculate on our end. We have analysts that work on it and we generate it's a lot of data crunching um, and, you know, they're released pretty far out from when they're actually collected, which is fine. I mean, it's necessary. And we love the fact that in this um, social media kind of world that um, you all brought up this point of, let's just get it out there real time. Let's put something out and do this stoplight. So yes, um, I've talked to a couple of groups about it, but we'll send it out as a procedural thing and any group that wants to adapt it can adopt it. I, I found it. Um... <clears throat> Interesting that that Stephen was able to access the data that Matt, um, that uh, North Fork Environmental Council gathered uh, in such short order and was able to get it up uh, out and out onto social media relatively quickly so that it is sort of real time um, or you know within a day of it being collected, which is really great. So I wanted to ask if uh, Stephen's reaction on whether he found it get into the data and um, if if not then uh, or if so how it could be improved or you know just the coordination between the two groups whether that was handy or clumsy or ha had any way to improve it if needed no it was actually um, very easy um, you know Dawn or Debbie would shoot me a, an email as soon as it was posted up to SharePoint I also would just check there you know on a regular basis but it was helpful to have the just the reminder that hey this data is up there and then I can go in and grab it um, and I created the template so that it was just an easier update um, and you know kind of just was able to, to just replicate it um, you know within about I don't know five or ten minutes and then just get it posted to social media and kind of had a system worked out so but the, the flow of data and using SharePoint was actually um, you know save the sounds SharePoint folders were extremely um, uh, organized and so I think that helped going back into and just you know downloading the PDF there wasn't a lot of clutter it was a very easy um, uh, process. I, I like the, the inclusivity of it and having more than one group involved. And in this case, we had all three groups of Save the Sound, North Fork Environmental Council and Save Mattituck Inlet all coordinating on this. And Peter, I was just wondering if um, in other places around Long Island Sound, if there are groups that don't really have the capacity necessarily to get out on a boat on a weekly basis or even bi-weekly and um, but want to participate somehow. If, if you might see this um, type of collaboration as being another um, pathway in for um, that groups that just don't have the, uh, the capacity to do what um, North Fork Environmental Council's been doing this year. Yeah, well, wow, that's a really good point. So, you know, plenty of the bays and harbors that we have groups monitoring in the 2024 20, groups that we have monitoring, you know, there likely are other groups that are in those, in those bays and harbors too. So. Um, when we put this call out to see if people are interested, um, we can certainly, you know, suggest that they also contact other groups that work in their watershed or embayment and see if they want to take this portion of the project on. That's a good call. A quick thing on the SharePoint, all the groups submit their data to SharePoint. And I thank you, Stephen. It is really well organized. A uh, big shout out to Elena Colon, our analyst on that. She really keeps it running in a way that's very accessible. We also look at those data sheets for quality assurance purposes throughout the season. Um, but, you know, our resources are somewhat limited. We do more screening. But it's really encouraging to hear that it worked well for this project. And, and we could tell it did. 
as you were posting these throughout the season. It really did work well. So thank you. So I just have one more question because, um, you know, I was wondering why is it we, we were trying to figure out why is it that you have to collect the data within three hours of sunrise? Oh, yeah, that's a good <laughs> that's a good point. Go back to the training slide uh, number five, I think, or whatever it is in the overview. But that's a really good question, Don. It's not to impede on anyone's beauty sleep, of course. Um, when you when we're collecting dissolved oxygen in shallow water in particular, although this happens in the top layers of deep water too, um, without getting too, too technical, dissolved oxygen is driven by um, plants and algae in the water. So when the sun's out and say you have a, a bay or harbor that's receiving a lot of nitrogen, a lot of nitrogen coming in from fertilizer and stormwater and you know septic or maybe wastewater treatment plants, whatever it is, um, that nitrogen gets in the water and it causes um, a lot of algae to grow like in the water in terms of phytoplankton, but in, in shallow water, also seaweeds, right? And macrophytes. And if you have a lot of seaweeds and a lot of algae in the water in the middle of the day, the oxygen levels can be really, really high, right? Because they're going through photosynthesis. Um, it can almost look like it's bubbling. And some of our more stressed embayments, it's almost counterintuitive. In the middle of the day, the dissolved oxygen can be really, really, really high. So high that there's bubbles in the water. But then all that plant mass uses oxygen at night. Plants respire, they use oxygen at night when the sun goes down. And if there's a lot of plants and a lot of macrophytes in the water, it almost vacuums. The, I mean, it's not that fast, but it's pretty fast. And it can go through daily, it does go through daily cycles where you could be way up at the top of your dissolved oxygen at say 1 p.m., but then at like 2 a.m., 3 a.m., it flatlines. And that's usually the way it goes. If it's really, really high during the day, typically at night, it can be really, really, really low. And that's very stressful for aquatic life. So we all collect data between three hours of sunrise. So your data, our data, your data, say, and save the sound. Our East Chester Bay data at 6 a.m. is very comparable to Mattituck Inlet or Creek at 6 a.m. But if we collected data at 1 p.m. and you were collecting data at 5 a.m., we lose that time comparability right away. Um, and that's why we all go out within three hours of sunrise. It's, it's totally driven by dissolved oxygen. That's the parameter that brings us all out of bed nice and early. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that answers a lot of questions. <laughs> so, so basically, Peter, you're saying um, you want to collect the samples at the time of day when the dissolved oxygen is likely to be lowest so that you can get a real picture of the stress on an ecosystem. That's right. And, you know, likely the lowest actually happens around 2 a.m. So we wanted to take it easy on people. You know, it could be around midnight. <laughs> so as long as people are getting the same window, at least. Um, then we can catch some of those hypoxic events and we can do that direct comparison. I mean, alternatively, we could have done all in the afternoon, but then we would have had to back calculate, and which is very challenging to do what it may have been in the morning based on multiple readings. Yes, Louise, the, in short, you're right, yes. Um, I actually have a few more questions that people put in the chat. So the first okay. question is, um, what is spotlight <laughs> or stoplight? Um, Maybe you want to answer that, Stephen? Sure. So the, the stoplight is made to look like a you know a stoplight on a street, so red, yellow, or green. Um, and it was just those are the easiest or sort of um, indicators. Uh, you know, so if somebody wants to just look at that page and just sort of a a flash page, they can see you know at a glance whether it's you know good, um, bad, or you know sort of cautionary. Um, the next question is, as a member of Save Mattituck Inlet, I'd like to know how many people are in the audience for this talk. So I'm looking right now, there's about, there were 19 or 20 people. Um, we will also, re, you know, we're recording this right now. So it will also be available on the website. There'll be a link that goes to our YouTube channel. Um, they just wanted to know how many people are concerned about these issues. Yeah. Um, and then there's one more question. Um, how many groups are testing for pathogens, fecal indicator bacteria on the New York side of the sound? Is this something the UWS aspires to include someday? Yeah, that's a great question. That one's from Rob, I think. Rob, it was good to see you in the audience. Um, how many groups are collecting fecal indicator bacteria in the New York portion of the sound? Well, there's a good core groups, I think, as you know, in New York City, we collect a lot of fecal indicator bacteria in Westchester County. Um, when we talk about fecal indicator bacteria, that relates to human health um, more so. I mean, it can in some ways relate to aquatic life too, but 
for the most part, when we talk about E. coli or enterococci, we're talking about how safe is the water for swimming or for recreation, like paddling and, and such. Um, on the North shore of Long Island, I know there's at least four groups, there's probably more, that collect fecal indicator bacteria on a regular basis. Is it an aspiration for the unified water study? Um, no, it's not. We specifically left it out. Um, but that being said, there's definitely, in Save the Sound and many other nonprofits' um, viewpoints, a need for a collective fecal indicator bacteria monitoring program, we could call it for now, similar to the unified water study, where everyone's doing things in a very similar kind of structured way procedurally. Um, they can decide to join in if they want, and then more resources and supplies and, and even funding to collect those data become available. Um, we've been talking about that in some of the Long Island Sound study work groups um, and some of the committees around the sound. And I would say in the future, a lot of us are hoping we can do something, we'll call it UWS-esque, I guess. Um, but no, it won't be embedded in the Unified Water Study because it's an ecological health study or monitoring program. Um, but keep your eyes peeled or stay tuned. Um, I think you'll be in a lot of those talks, Rob, as we move forward in developing a Long Island Sound watershed-wide even um, procedure for FIB, fecal indicator bacteria data collection. That's a great question. Uh, Louise Harrison just made a comment. She said Suffolk County collects fecal indicator data on bathing yeah. beaches, maybe Nassau too. She wasn't sure. Yeah, well, the health departments certainly do. Um, and I was more talking about nonprofits. Um, across the Sound, there's 200 plus swimming beaches um, where people actually go and they're designated for swimming. And they're all monitored, depending on where you are, North Shore, Long Island, Suffolk County Department of Health. Um, I believe the Nassau County Department of Health in Nassau, New York City, the Department of, what are they? It's DOHM, but it's their health department, Westchester County Department of Health. And then when you get in Connecticut, it's usually town health departments that do those sampling, but they all collect fecal indicator bacteria for beach management. And if you go to Sound Health Explorer and you look at the um, beach grades, that's in the swimmable portion of Sound Health Explorer, you can see we've graded all of those data too and broken all the beaches down to grades based on fecal indicator bacteria pulled it from a very large federal database where the data go, which can be somewhat challenging to get them back out and uh, made it easier for people to view and see in one place. Well, I can say we certainly learned a lot from this project um, and uh, it was wonderful having uh, this collaboration, being able to work with with everyone, and um, I know, uh, again, Dawn and, and Dan, uh, <laughs> we couldn't have done it without you guys, so thank you so very much, because it was challenging for you, I know it was, and. Uh, yeah, but they did a good job. I heard that you all did a fantastic job. You know, I'm not quite as into it. I just, I'm very into it. I'm just not quite into the like everyday aspect of it anymore, but I heard from Elena and our team that you all did a really great job on your first oh. year. So we're looking forward to continued years with your, with your team. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I think Margaret had a question in here too. Margaret de Cruz, I was just reading it. I hadn't talked a lot about, yeah, the, so I talked a lot about the dissolved oxygen parameters. Um, well, I don't know about a lot, actually. I didn't want to get too technical, but um, some of the other parameters we mentioned for our monitor and why they're important, I can kind of quickly overview those. Um, turbidity is a measure of water clarity. So the more turbid water is, um, the more, say, cloudy it can be. Long Island Sound is an estuary, you know, where fresh water and, and salt water from the Atlantic Ocean mix. It's not supposed to be crystal clear. Um, sometimes there's this misconception that, you know, clear water equals healthy water. In an estuary, our water shouldn't be crystal clear. In fact, something would be terribly wrong if the waters of Long Island Sound were crystal clear um, because it's just, it's not supposed to be. But when it gets very murky and very turbid and cloudy, um, then it's usually due to human impacts, maybe um, sediment and erosion or from rainstorms and stormwater and construction sites, whatever it may be. Um, so as turbidity goes up higher on our grading scale, it gets a poor grade. Um, so that's water clarity. Chlorophyll A is a measure of um, a pigment in plants. And it's our measure of phytoplankton, which is small kind of microscopic algae floating in the water. We need chlorophyll A is essential. Like without chlorophyll A in the environment, there really wouldn't be the environment as we know it, right? Because we need plants. But it's a measure of if there's too much algae in the water, too much phytoplankton in the water, it's indicative of too much nitrogen entering the water. So it's an indicator of the pollutant that comes in. Um, and then 
qualitative macrophytes is a fancy way of just saying that we do a um, general assessment of how much uh, seaweed is in the embayment. So we see how much plant matter is floating in the water in terms of algae, but then we also look at like, you know, your green seaweeds and red and brown seaweeds and how much is there. We need seaweeds for a healthy environment in Long Island Sound and the bays and harbors, but again, too much like mats and mats of green seaweed, for example, is very indicative of a nutrient nitrogen problem. And then we look at temp and salinity because while well, the songs collect that data, so why wouldn't we? But we don't grade temp and salinity now, but we do have some plans maybe to get to Rob's point, even though it's not fecal indicator bacteria, to start looking more and more at temperature, of course, with climate change and, and things that are happening. That baseline temperature data will be really important in all these bays and harbors and we can continue to monitor it. Um, salinity is also really important just as a measure of what's going on with mixing and such. So those are the other parameters. I won't get into tier two, you're welcome to email me. You can look me up and, and you can even give me a call and I'll talk to you about the more technical stuff that we do in the tier two monitoring. I, I, can you hear me? I have another question for, um, for uh, North Fork Environmental Council. Are there any takeaways or um, suggestions for other groups doing this kind of monitoring or suggestions for Save the Sound from your experience this year? Wow, that's a good question. I should have been prepared for that. Well, you can talk uh, to us anytime <laughs> about suggestions. You know what I mean? You, you, <laughs> Luis can put us on the spot at a webinar, which is fine, but you're that's welcome my to job. talk to us anytime <laughs> about, about the Unified Water Study. Um, I mean, I guess, you know, I do realize that this year was a little tough because of COVID. I mean, we did not have any hands on training um, yeah. and we had to do it all online or ask questions. Um, you know, and Elena was available. We could, we could email her. She would set up a call with us anytime, a Zoom call. Um, but I, it might have helped a little bit being able, being able to do it in person. Um, it just wasn't possible this year because of, you know. Yeah, you're so right, Don. It The in-person trainings go a long, long way. So you're one of about three groups that were impacted by COVID and that we couldn't do that first year, especially for your first year, right? Like after your first year, even though we bring everyone together every year anyhow, that first year is really important with that hands-on training. So while we put together the, the learning modules and spent a lot of time, right, putting together those online modules and like videos of us with the equipment, um, that in-person training is really important. So let's all just hope and pray for more than just our equipment reasonings that we get beyond this COVID hump and we can all get together um, in future years and do those trainings in person because it's technical. What we're doing out there, what you've done, what you've accomplished is incredibly technical work. Like you really deserve major kudos. It's, it's structured, you know, people pay hundreds of dollars for these type of data per an hour, right? Like, and like don't get any ideas on raising your on your funding request through Debbie for that. But people really like going to a consulting group, say, like a private consulting group to collect these type of data at this level of quality. It, it's really, I mean, every group, not just your group is collecting amazing data and then submitting it for like so many different purposes, Clean Water Act, report card, you know, and other things aside. I mean, you did a great job and you'll get hands on training soon. <laughs> Our fingers yeah. Well, yeah, all the more reason to compliment North Fork Environmental Council for the hurdles you overcame in doing this and um, and being able to submit such high quality data with uh, just the kind of training that you were able to uh, garner. And um, and kudos to Peter and his unit uh, for, for putting together those online seminars in such a way that people can can learn from them so effectively and then go out and do a great job. So, um, you know, and I also know, Peter, that, that you and Stephen worked very collaboratively and in relatively short order pulling the uh, stoplight program together so that the data could be publicized. So I, I, I just, I'm, I'm smiling at this end. You can't see me, but I, I think it, it sounds like a really great year for all involved. Thanks, Luis. <laughs> Um, I actually have one more question. It says, as I kayak westward on Long Creek, I have noticed increased pollution algae as I get closer to Strong's Marina. Is this possible sewage discharge from the boats? Yeah, that's a great question. That's hard to say. I mean, um, 
often when we get more and more into the tight areas of our creeks and inlets and waterways, you get less flushing of the water with the tides um, and other things can happen. I, I couldn't personally answer that question and say yes or no. Um, I don't know if it's that specific marina, if there's more just development as a whole in that portion where you have more impervious surface or hard surfaces where stormwater easily can wash in, it's hard to say. Um, but if you have a hunch that that might be something that's going on, if you want to reach out to North Fork Environmental Council, maybe you're a member, um, we could talk about how you could process some of those fecal indicator bacteria samples that Rob brought up. Um, we wouldn't necessarily take them at our lab in West. I mean, you're welcome to drive hours to our lab in Westchester and we would process them. But I think we could connect you with someone. Um, I know we could connect you with groups that are closer that could process some um, bacteria samples so you could see if there is some um, potential sewage discharge from the marina or other places. And that's not just a loose statement. Go ahead and do it. We'll, we'll, we'll make it work. I just, I might not follow up with whoever that was tomorrow, but please take my word on it and follow up with us and we'll, we'll help out with that situation. Okay, great. I think that's all the questions, Debbie. So. Well, thank you. Thanks to everyone for joining us this evening. And um, yeah, let us know if you have any questions. As Dawn mentioned, um, you know, you can always email us, but we will have the, um, video of this uh, presentation up on our YouTube channel and along with many others. So please um, spread the word that it's there if anyone is interested. Um, and uh, happy holidays to everyone. Enjoy. Thank you again, all of you participants and um, presenters. Thanks for all right. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Good night. Good night.